Greetings. You're tuned in to Hope 2020. Thanks so much for being part of this nine day conference. We're here on day three. It's Monday, July 27th as we're recording and we're uh, in conversation with Pavel. This is a talk, solar punk, cyberpunk and pop culture technological narratives. This is gonna be a fascinating talk. Uh, Pavel is a hacker, solar punk educator and also a advocate and activist for free software and open notebook science. We're going to hear quite a bit about where solar fits into the uh, big picture and some hacker perspectives on it. Let's tune into the movie and we will then return for some live discussion. Hey, my name is Pavel Gay and I have to tell you, recording stuff without an audience and actually looking in the camera, speaking long sentences is much, much harder than giving anything at the actual conference. I would like to tell you about how technology is represented in the most popular fictional narratives, how this affects the real world, and especially the hacker community. I've been researching this for the last few years, working on a project called Glider Inc, aiming to explain the hacker values to the general public. Professionally, I'm a web developer, and as an activist, I teach the basics of cybersecurity at published public schools, community centers, and others. I also help raise awareness about the real hacker spaces of the Global South, many of you have, may, have probably not heard about. I'm also an active member of the Solarpunk movement, about which I will tell you more in this presentation. One of the most life-changing moments of my life was visiting a hacker space for the first time. I fell in love with the curious community, playing with the technology freely, not worried about turning profit or the academic red tape. As a neuroscience student at the university at the time, I was made to wait to have access to a machine, a piece of software, or even a public piece of experimental data. I was told I needed to study for many more years before I will be able to design my first experiment. In the meantime, the hackers just did things, shared the results, put everything in the open and celebrated it. They treated the technology playfully, often helping people from outside of the hacker space when they needed something redesigned or tweaked. I loved being a part of this community, but as I started talking to people back at the uni or outside of it, I realized I can't really explain what hacker spaces are to those who don't already know it. This is what inspired me to start working on a project called Glider Inc, a graphic novel to explain what hackerspace and the hacker values are. People tend to see them as vibrant communities, but are completely clueless as to what they are about. The first thing I found on the course of the project is that we have absolutely no language to describe those concepts to somebody who is not a technologist already. Why open this? Why tweak? Why share? Someone might steal it. To explain something for which we have no notions or words in the general discourse, we fall back to known narratives and we, tend up, and we end up with warped and misaligned representations, sometimes more hurtful than helpful. I needed to deconstruct a lot of my own preconceptions about hackers and hacking in order to present them as humane with comprehensible goals and familiar drives. One of the most important revelations I had is that for an average person, technology is transparent. That is, until it breaks. You cannot talk about something transparent. It's not a valid subject. It needs to be made visible to talk about it. People don't know about how cellular network works when making a call, and most of them are not even aware of it. They have a basic practical understanding, and unless something goes wrong, there's no need to go deeper. This is not ignorance. We cannot be aware of every aspect of our reality at once. We need to abstract some of it. The trick here is to find a way to bring people's attention to technology. Then, when something is already visible, you can start looking at its context. All the things beyond technology which shape and influence it. Who builds technology? Who owns it? Who profits from it? The hacker community says a lot of these questions as valid and openly discusses them, 
but they may be completely esoteric to an average person. Who owns my smartphone? Me, of course! I paid for it! Then there is a question for whom the technology is designed. This is something even hackers don't ask themselves too often, and it's a very valid question in itself. You may hear it from some academics or disability activists, for whom the whom is not invisible. This leads us to another revelation. Technology is complex, but its context is even more complex. Why was it designed this way and not the other? It's not something we learn from a manual. We need to analyze and observe how technology is shaped and used around us to deduce it. For example, a smartphone is an unimaginably complex piece of tech. It has layers of hardware, specialized computing units, and then on top of that, 15 million lines of Android code. What we don't see analyzing the smartphone is that it also has a quarter million patents which dictate how it's built, what it can and cannot do, and how it should do it. It's therefore dictated by our economy and culture, things independent from just scientific or engineering logic. Hackers have their saying, RTFM, read the fucking manual. They are not intimidated by documentation, and they like to analyze and study technology. It's visible to them. The majority of regular people don't study technology. They acquire knowledge through observing how others use it, through the culture surrounding it. The cultural narratives surrounding technology are far from objective. They make a lot of implicit assumptions, deciding what we see and what we don't. There are multiple sources of the narratives. Some of them, like ads, are pretty open about why th what they are doing and why. Others only show people utilizing the technology in a particular way, making its other uses seem foreign or alien. For example, why don't we store music on our devices but stream it instead, even if it's the same album over and over again? Companies like Apple master conveying the context in more than just an ad. Thinking about Apple products, you have more than just an idea of how to use them. With them you are creative and intelligent, as they are for creative people. Those contexts change how we see the world around us. A good example of this is when last year the Even Horizon Telescope captured the first ever image of a black hole. It was a scientific milestone, but in the news it was quickly overshadowed by a cultural conflict. Dr. Katie Bowman, who created one of the main algorithms used to build the image, was presented by some reporters as the face of the team, which started a very toxic and sexist debate whether she is good enough to be seen as the sole discoverer. No one listened to Dr. Bauman, who at multiple occasions emphasized that it's a work of a team, not a single person. Why? We expect each discovery and each invention to be created by a single, preferably white and male, person. It's hard to tell stories of teams behind an invention without a single face to associate them with. Let's look at the popular culture around us and try to understand why. The most widespread narratives in the popular culture will be the ones in video form, whether in a cinema, as a TV or a streaming series. More people will have access to them than anything presented only in a book or even a graphic novel format. I'd like to look at genres which present a world close to our own, with similar culture and social order, and analyze how they portray technology. While there are multiple interesting takes in post-apocalyptic, horror or far science fiction stories, they aren't as close to home and don't influence our perceptions of the real world as much. The first of them has been popular in the last decade's superhero cinema, pushed by both Marvel, DC and the few independent storytellers. The superhero narrative focuses on exceptional individuals with superpowers. One of such powers is being a genius and being able to create technology. The geniuses are able to design, prototype, test, debug, produce and use multiple pieces of technology which would normally take dozens of people months or years to create. And they still have time to fight their enemies. 
What's interesting, their technology is effectively a black box. Only other characters with a genius trait are able to comprehend or use it. Mortal scientists or engineers can try to reverse engineer something, but never use it on par with the superhero. The superhero mythology gives technology a new context. It is always a weapon. Even if it's not intended to be used as such, it could be, and it's always a potential threat. Moreover, all technology is very singular. Those are artifacts, one-of-a-kind pieces that no one but the superheroes can use. It is never infrastructure. It cannot be used to change other people's lives. Superheroes use it themselves to preserve whatever is the status quo of the world. There are no democratic decisions or a widespread adoption of tech. The world stays how it always was. If a group of people, not superheroes or military, creates or takes over some technology wanting to do something with it, they are usually the villains of the story. The context is, it's always a weapon. The last two Spider-Man movies were a good example of that trope. The Best Man Salvage, a fictional company who lost their contracts because of Tony Stark, the Iron Man, but managed to acquire some super technology, couldn't use the alien energy generators to help hospitals or push science forward. They needed to make them into weapons. No other story could be told within the superhero genre. Only superheroes and the military can wield technology responsibly. Do you see where this leads us? Another piece of context from the superhero stories is the technological progress comes independently from the social one. The superhero stories visualize multiple very technologically advanced societies Wakanda, Asgard, Atlantis, yet none of them is more just, more equal, more free than any society from our world. What's worse, they are all violent despotic kingdoms. Wakanda imagines a monarchy where you can challenge the king and obtain the throne through pure violence and the clans, oligarchy, can only advise the king. It's no wonder that the magical vibranium appears there as a weapon. If the movie villain, wanting to empower black people worldwide, put a little more thought into his plan, he could have stabilized the energy grid across Africa introduce vibranium technologies to the universities across the continent and easily rival American and Chinese geopolitical influences. This is not a movie about that though. This is a movie about easy to imagine violent solutions. The lack of moral or social progress makes us stop expecting it when talking about the use of technology. We won't use them to work together better, more efficiently or to solve social problems. With time, we'll just get more powerful weapons. As we get used to these stories and internalize them, we start taking this context into the real world and expecting to see the same patterns around us. We see Elon Musk, clearly a genius inventor on par with Batman or Iron Man, and accept that all the inventions from his company are made by him, not hundreds of scientists and engineers working for him. He is the face of our better tomorrow. We stay blind to the real movements changing the world both technologically and socially, such as the Wikipedians, who are creating a common base of human knowledge available for everyone. What was once a utopian dream of science fiction writers became real, and now it's impossible to even articulate in our popular culture, because we don't have language to tell the story. Another genre which wants us to forget about social progress is cyberpunk. When we try to imagine a realistic future for our own world, we extrapolate the technological progress only. We see the same capitalism, but with even more power concentrated in the hands of a few corporations and a few lone warriors fighting it. The 99% are even poorer and more powerless than today, and the technology allows the top 1% to keep them in check better than any totalitarian regime was ever able to do before. The technology of cyberpunk is designed and manufactured by the corporations, for customers, not users. If anyone decides to utilize it against the giants, 
is through a hacker's transgression against the intended use. Technology in cyberpunk is always either a means of oppression, control, or a way to fight it. There's nothing in between. Neutral technology doesn't exist. The story of Wikipedia and millions of people who created it must be unsaid or, if mentioned, shown as a tragic and futile, killed or taken over by the corporations. Cyberpunk can't imagine any alternatives to corporate overlords. It locks us in the endless and hopeless fight against them, and everything is a tool in this fight. What was initially written as a warning has charmed us with its aesthetic and neon lights, normalizing the corporate capitalism, constant surveillance and diminishing human rights. We stopped telling stories of other possible futures, with different social orders. Almost every story set in a realistic new future started having cyberpunk context, tropes and aesthetics. They are sexy. They sell well. And each time a romantic cyberpunk hero manages to win their battles, we know it's only temporary because we imagine no other possible state of the world. So because we couldn't think of any alternatives, we embraced Siri in our homes. We accepted gig economy and the fact that Uber drivers aren't given the basic worker rights we spend decades fighting for. And at some point, whether through corporate language and ads, or the oversaturation of cyberpunk media. Cyberpunk became our default vision of the future. The term cyberpunk replaced the word futuristic in multiple cultures around the world. I heard it from Egyptian and Malaysian hackers wishing for a more cyberpunk, meaning technologically advanced, future. We forgot the context that this genre carried with itself, and now it's hard to imagine better technology, better medicine, without the corporate capitalism and oppression. Cyberpunk created a false dichotomy that by being a technologist, you need to be either a pro-establishment entrepreneur, obedient to the corporate master, or a rebel hacker. Again, with nothing in between. The story of Wikimedians and their work, their infrastructure and knowledge remains impossible to tell once again. A lot of hackers accepted their role in cyberpunk narrative as rebels against the corporate and governmental machines. They wanted technology to be free, and this meant a war. They do not see, or ignore, that in almost every story, the civilians and bystanders are hurt in the war against corporations. For an average person, a romantic rebel is a bigger threat than the capitalism itself. Look at Watch Dogs 2, a game whose creators actually went to Noisebridge, one of the most open and inclusive hacker communities in the world. They took photos and notes. When they recreated in-game, the hacker space members instead print weapons and killer drones, have no problems with killing and attacking innocent bystanders just to bring down the evil corporate overlords. We may have cringed, but we largely accepted this narrative. It's so cool, so very cyberpunk. The context of cyberpunk changed how we imagine specific technologies of the future as well. One of the most staple symbols of street samurais and netrunners are cybernetic limbs. They became an aesthetic we fell in love with. In the real world, the notion of advanced prosthetic limbs became fashionable, marketable and sexy, severely limiting our perspectives. We don't really ask disabled people if this is what they need and we often press them to wear useless aesthetic prosthetics just because they look better than a stamp. Because a cumbersome glove with some leads is seen as sexy. There are a lot of other things we can do for the disabled people. Researching assistive technologies and adjusting the technology we create to fit wider variety of bodies and disabilities. Those are sadly omitted in cyberpunk narratives. And since our technology is often blind to disability, we lack a language to address that. A few years ago, a group of disabled photographers signed a petition to create professional DSLR cameras with buttons on the left side, so that they are able to operate them without their right hands. 
The request was ignored and spawned a few cruel internet jokes. It didn't get much traction in the press. By allowing cyberpunk to become our default future, we allowed cybernetic limbs to be our cultural answer to disability, putting other perspectives outside of the spotlight, sometimes even forgetting that they exist. The cyberpunk vision is almost universally dystopian. The renderings where it does bring some hope for a better tomorrow, it's usually called post-cyberpunk. Something happened to introduce the social change. We are rarely shown what and how this happened, since it's almost impossible to imagine from within a cyberpunk narrative. Meanwhile, in the real world, we are facing the global crisis of climate change, while lacking the cultural tools to imagine viable solutions to it. If we were to go with cyberpunk answers, we'd allow the corporations to build their hyper-advanced safe and safe heavens for themselves and condemn millions of people to death and despair. If we see no other possible future for ourselves, can we survive to that magical change and some post-cyberpunk? But we can look with a different perspective. There is a new genre being born which focuses on climate change and our response to it. It wants to present a world where we can change ourselves to address, avoid and overcome the catastrophes and we can create better, more sustainable societies. It's called solar punk. It is a rebel in a way few other punks dare to be, hoping for a better tomorrow, painting a promise, not a warning. It wants to create a vision of a better but not conflictless future. It understands we need a social change, with new priorities and new power structures. It focuses on craftsmanship, community and technology powered by renewable energy. Technology created intentionally and adjusted to local needs, especially outside of the Western narrative. Doesn't this sound familiar, similar to what the hacker movement is striving for? Solarpunk wants to give us a whole set of ideas and hieroglyphs to imagine what we can do, how we can collaborate, what we can create in the real world, paint a goal we can all strive for. It wants to look at world outside of the West and learn from it, listen to local needs, analyze local solutions. The proponents of Solarpunk understand how vital the aesthetics were in making Cyberpunk popular and propose their own. Green cities full of plants, nature integrated in our infrastructure, human scale and human oriented planning. Farther, stained glass and art nouveau, technology in simple and elegant, often organic forms. If cyberpunk saw a night cityscape full of neons and smog, solarpunk wants the sun and the shade, natural vibrant colors, clean air with birds and windmills on the horizon. It wants infrastructure reclaimed and remade, with new life breathed into it, with nothing going to waste. Because why does the future need to be cold and sterile? Solarpunk wants us to forget what we know about capitalist and cyberpunk technology. Instead of mass-produced devices with planned obsolescence intended to break in a few years so you can buy a new one, we need sustainability. The devices are yours. Tweak them, customize them, maintain them and reuse them. We want to have technology we can upgrade and use for decades. We are all part of the ecosystem and we don't want to waste our finite resources manufacturing closed crap. Finally, Solarpunk is about communities and human scale. If we are to create a world without toxic corporate hierarchies, we need to relearn how to work together, how to stay connected, share our knowledge and help each other. It's a world without techno-solutionism. It accepts that engineering in itself won't solve every problem. It wants the solutions to be intentional, local and adjusted to the needs of people living in a given community. It imagines technology to be created in spaces very similar to the hacker spaces we know, communal with multiple people tweaking them, sharing inputs and perspectives. When talking to solarpunk writers, I realized that a lot of them would like to invent the concept of a hackerspace, 
not knowing that it actually exists, since it hasn't been visible in the culture they have access to. In Solarpunk, technology is empowering. It's something you own and use, co-create. It doesn't own you. It's also not a weapon. While it may be dangerous, we shouldn't look at it just as a threat. It's something we can discuss and together decide how to put to the best use. We can create great feats of technology we are proud of, not afraid of. Since the golden age of science fiction, we haven't really dreamt about using the technology to create something great. And it's a good time to start. Solarpunk wants to show us a lot of visions from all over the world, instead of just importing the globalized Western culture. As a wise Egyptian hacker told me once, Solarpunk without the local perspective is just another greenwashed imperialism, where the only American and Chinese solar panels would be green enough and using anything else is irresponsible. It's a great opportunity to look at the hacker spaces, maker spaces and activists from the global south that have been virtually absent from our narrative so far, despite having huge successes in their own communities and cultures. I'm a member of Global Innovation Gathering, a network of very real innovators from around the world coordinating hubs in Africa, South America and Southeast Asia. I know of so many stories that did not get any traction in the West just because somebody couldn't imagine an Arabic or an African hacker and assume that no reader or viewer would be interested in that either. With Solarpunk, there is a chance to change that. Fictional narratives are not only visions of some future or a possible world, but also the lens through which we view our own reality. For a long time we chose to see everything through a cyberpunk glass, not paying attention to things which didn't fit into that perspective, until our world started becoming more like cyberpunk. The solarpunk stories already exist around the world, we just choose to ignore them, or we see them in a different light. If we want to change the world around us, we must change our perspective and make them cool. Right now, if you tell an average person about hacker community, they will think about the attacks of the Anonymous or Mr. Robot's violent F society. And the hacker movement is so much more than just a rebellion. The hackerspace communities around the world are unique spaces of cooperation and knowledge sharing, creating something new without academic red tape and the pressure to be profitable. We can define ourselves not just in opposition to something, but with our own values. This doesn't mean being apolitical, but setting a positive example of something we can build. Seeing that there is a way to tell stories about hackerspaces, if we only decide to ditch the cyberpunk cliches, I'd like to show you what more I learned. In the Glider Inc. project, I don't want to present hackers as a uniform body of the tech wizards. I want to show the variety and social roles within a hackerspace. Everyone with their own goals and approaches. I created example characters based on five stances or archetypes I often found in hackerspaces all around the world. The inventor, always working on their projects, hell-bent on finishing no matter what, spending yet another sleepless night over signal analysis or PCB schematics. The anarchist, always political and ready to organize something, caring deeply about the community, using hackerspace to fix their stuff and be independent. The activist, who wants to share their knowledge with the general public, works with NGOs and petitions local government to finally get it right. The maker, who doesn't want any politics in their space, comes here to rest and relax with some woodworking, 3D printing or Arduinos, often teaching them to their kids. The troll, using and abusing technology for the lulz, surprising others with something totally unexpected, creating transgressive art and starting flame wars. There are many more, 
but with those five I feel we can start explaining how vibrant and beautiful the hacker communities really are. This still leaves people who don't understand why do you need to change the technology? And to explain that, I needed a character for whom the technology is not invisible. Someone who needs to modify it to be able to use it, for whom it wasn't explicitly designed. A disabled person. You can easily understand and empathize with someone who loves photography, but cannot use a camera without building some kind of interface on their own. It is no longer an inexplicable tech wizard archetype, but someone humane, who you can follow more closely and who can introduce you to the world of people who choose to modify the technology and who are curious about it. There are a lot of other considerations to take. Sometimes known tropes are better to be avoided, other times addressed and subverted. Creating an accessible and interesting story is really tricky. You might feel that it's a little bit too much. Narratives don't impact us that much. Hackers are always outside of the system, natural rebels. We often don't want to tell our own stories to the wider public. Not in a way which could explain our motivations, our goals. But if we won't present our own narrative, we will be written into someone else's, out of ignorance or as a calculated move. We can paint ourselves or allow us to be painted as eternal rebels. A lot of people will see us with all the connotations that come with it, as a threat to their daily lives, their normalcy, as someone who they shouldn't listen to when we warn them about a coming threat that only we notice. It can be a corporate monopoly or the end of the internet neutrality. We won't be heard. Or we could tell stories of our hacker communities as something more than just rebels working against the system, as the trailblazers, tweakers, inventors, people building something new, something wonderful, without red tape or quarterly profits. We need to present the hacker community as an ally to an average person, not a threat. Someone they can hear. And with that, thank you. And we're back. That was fascinating. Thank you so much, Pavel. Thank you. The conference is awesome. Thank you for organizing it. We're having a fantastic time here. Uh, there's been a very robust uh, discussion in the in the chat, and uh, so we have a we, we have a few questions that I think we can uh, we can talk through. The first one you and I were actually talking about before the uh, movie began, or right when it began. Um, and I know this talk was not about solar energy, but I thought it was interesting when you characterized the state of solar energy in Poland. Would would you take a moment and uh, and do that for us? Oh, I, I can do the general. Uh, Poland is very much against solar and wind, uh, wind energy right now. And if you read about uh, the global approaches to that, Poland seems to find a cultural refuge in using coal. And uh, we are like the, the national narrative is uh, that uh, we are proud to use coal. Uh, luckily, I know a lot of activists from all like all sides of political spectrum. So it's not always the left as uh, uh, it is often in the many countries, but we have a lot of activists pushing for uh, nuclear energy, pushing for wind, pushing for solar. Of course, Poland doesn't have as good uh, weather as uh, southern countries, uh, so we cannot use uh, just solar. We don't have as much wind. Uh, to actually put stuff uh, in the sea. But I believe that within the next few decades, we should be able to get to something much cleaner than we are now. I, I really hope so. Thanks for that. Yeah, and I know that was a little off the topic, but I thought it was an interesting uh, fact that not too many people are aware of. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about these superhero stories that you spent some time on. And I guess what I wasn't so clear on is, do you think that the superhero you know, narrative on the whole are positive towards a better future? Or are they maybe not so helpful because, the, of course, they're not very realistic? So I think uh, 
what superhero stories do is they focus on the individual. Like, uh, a lot of superhero stories are about single characters or small groups of them. And we, they tend to make us lose the, uh, lose the bigger picture forget that there are a lot of people making things work. As I mentioned with Iron Man, we see one person who create, like went through the whole development process that we as technologists know will take months or years uh, for a lot of people and they are able to create that quickly and they are shown as a single inventor. So uh, it also creates that, uh, that notion that people who use technology are specifically gifted. You are that genius, that tech wizard, because nobody, like no regular person can understand how Iron Man's uh, armor is working. You need to be a genius on similar level. And I feel that this really hurts the general notion that uh, it's something we co-create. And it makes us forget about infrastructure. In some Iron Man movies, uh, we see him working on the energy network, energy grid, but this is only just a few minutes. And uh, then it's all about creating new pieces of tech uh, uh, for himself. And we totally lose the ability to talk about technology for the whole society. And we hmm. stop asking questions. Hey, uh, Mr. Stark, why don't you create like small energy generators for every hospital worldwide? Like in Syria, they could really use it right now. Mm -hmm. so, so I think they are in general harmful as they may be nice as one voice, but we got so oversaturated by superhero uh, tropes that it's really hard to, to show people that other things exist. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I feel like um, the, uh, just the patents alone. So when you think of the quarter million patents to make an iPhone, how many yes. patents would have made the Iron Man suit, right? And who in the world could, could have enough time in their life to develop that many patents. It doesn't, even if you're not filing the patents, you have to develop the 250,000 uh, separate ideas that are yes. necessary. So I think you're saying it's just not realistic as an individual, it really takes a community. It's, it's not realistic, but they also play it uh, right in the, in the movies. Like you see other inventors saying, I will not work with Starks because they will steal my technologies. Mm. And it's, it's a thing even in the, in the MCU universe, it becomes aware of itself, mm -hmm. but it doesn't help because it's, uh, it's shown as a running joke, not as a valid criticism. You know, we had a, a keynote by Cory Doctorow. I don't know if he's on your bookshelf behind you. I have a feeling he, he probably he is. is. Yeah, I had a I feeling. But he's, he's um, in a couple of his books, he's talked about people that come up with great ideas and then they grant the patent to the public domain, basically. They make an open license. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, uh, do you think that's got to be part of the future? Or, you know, the, the more where, where you lock an idea and a little like the GPL, you're not locking an idea for private use, you're locking an idea for you know, public use, for the public benefit. So I actually had an honor of working on a similar project or rather uh, helping present it because I don't want to say I, I contributed anything legally to that. Uh, there is a Polish German lawyer, Natalia Łukasiewicz, uh, who created a project called Greenbase which uh, has several layers, but one of it is uh, to create uh, basically a GPL repository of patents. So you basically patent something, but uh, just to have a defense so that nobody can use it uh, for commercial use. Mm. Nobody mm. can sue any hacker and a maker uh, for working on this specific thing. And I believe this needs to be a part of our world. I don't know how close it is. Uh, I know that EFF and Corey are working towards mm -hmm. this goal, but seeing how everything goes with Apple and all the US cases, yes. it will be a battle. It seems like we've made good progress on copyright with things like GPL and Creative Commons, but pat patents, not as much. Yep. Um, another question, you know, we had, 
you're an optimistic person. You're, you're, you're trying to guide us towards an optimistic future. And, uh, you know, and you see that future and yet there's also a lot of, uh, so, so there's optimism and hopefulness that I, I sense you're advocating for, but there's also a lot of negativity and helplessness or perceived helplessness. And, and do you have recommendations to, to help the people of hope to balance those and maybe come out more on the optimistic side? Mm -hmm. So a lot of works you will uh, you will read around technology and hacker culture, especially from Corey, are pretty depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, his whole last series with Homeland uh, is really depressing. It's realistic but depressing. But solar punk books that are coming up uh, uh, in bigger and bigger number are trying to create a vision of the world which is more optimistic and uh, a world which we don't need to destroy the planet to actually uh, create something better. So there is uh, there are a lot of takes because Solarpunk doesn't have any flagship single book uh, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Neuromancer was for Cyberpunk. Uh, Solarpunk has a few nice anthologies like uh, the Sun Vault, Solarpunk Winters and Summers. But there's also that one book that I really like and I really think that hackers could take a look at. It's, co it's called Game Changer by LX Beckett. And it tries to imagine a future, uh, a few years, uh, a few hundred years uh, uh, ahead of us where we actually uh, we had a series of ecological catastrophes, but we managed to rebuild and we managed to create a new global society which doesn't allow uh, uh, such exploitation of the planet and which is sustainable. And what I think really interesting is that it, it's not only technological, but it takes a lot of uh, questions about technology, like, sorry, it's not about only ecological. It takes a lot of questions about technology that uh, hackers are really passionate about. For example, uh, what about privacy? Uh, what about uh, patents? What about copyright? What about working together in the future? And it tries to imagine a world which will need to deal that, with that and how such world could uh, look like. Uh, I really like it as uh, as something showing the direction. I not I don't necessarily agree with every single uh, concept there, but I think this is a piece of optimistic fiction that uh, we could all use. Mm, thanks. So Game Changers by Alex Beckett. Yes. All right. Um, it, it's interesting. We had another question that was uh, sort of a literary question as well. It was about uh, Becky Chambers, uh, that there's an upcoming solar punk series. And, and I was curious that someone in the Matrix chat was curious whether you had read works. And if so, how do you see this uh, Wayfairy series um, as fitting in to cyberpunk or solar punk? So uh, sadly, I haven't heard about this author. And uh, what I can tell you is that people are approaching Solarpunk from a lot of different directions. And I really like it because for some people, it's uh, very post-apocalyptic as in something big needs to happen for, uh, happen for us all to, to start paying attention to the environment. For some others is, hey, we can actually avert catastrophes. Uh, for some people, it's creating utopias, uh, something that, uh, you know, this is the world we can arrive at if we try. Uh, mm -hmm. Some authors are trying to go with, uh, uh, this is like uh, uh, a utopia, something that is better than, uh, than our today, but still not perfect. And uh, for me, the most important part of Solarpunk that still not, author, not all authors uh, see is, focusing on community and not just a group of characters, but like wider community, how they fit in the, uh, in the society, what they do. And uh, when working on that uh, little hackerspace project of mine, I'm trying to show how different people in their daily lives relate to, uh, to each other and how they don't need to be single heroes, uh, but how they all create something awesome together. And Solarpunk gives you space for that. And this is what's, what I would really like to, uh, to like send uh, to everybody. 
We uh, we talked a little bit about Corey before, and uh, I want you mentioned little brother, but in the walk away book, it talks about some of these themes. And what I'm curious about, so you might want to comment on that, but what I'm more curious about is in in science fiction, especially, you have spaceships, you have populating other worlds, you have worlds, you know, that are 10,000 worlds in 10,000 years in the future. Do, do you think there are, I don't know if there are exemplars, but do you think there's a uh, an overlap for some of those more so let's say standard sci-fi genres, or are they really, uh, you know, standing separately? Uh, so I think there are a lot of overlap for uh, with standard science fiction, but uh, we have a lot of technologies that we think in a very different context. Like uh, we tend to think about terraforming and creating a whole new ecosystem on Mars. But hey, we may need that on Earth pretty soon. We may need to actually uh, start paying attention to how everything works and uh, and do something with it and be careful with it. Uh, with Corey's walk away, I fell in love with the first few chapters. That was a perfect book. Me but too. then he did the exact post-cyberpunk move that uh, I described. He came up with uh, some super technology that suddenly changed how society works. And it stopped being a book about small communities. It was a cyberpunk book about this time the rebels winning. Mm -hmm. and And this made me pretty sad because Exploring what the hackers in Walkaway did in the first few chapters, how they created their communities, how they make them made them sustainable, this was awesome, and I want to read more books about that. Mm -hmm. I had exactly the same reaction, so thank you for that. Everyone should read Walkaway by Corey Doctorow. Yes. It is, it is, the little brother is fantastic and it's, and scary, but Walkaway offers somewhat of a blueprint towards a possible future that that I think overlaps a lot with what you've been talking about. Um, yes, I know there's others that you recommend as well. I, I just wanted to mention that one because Corey keynoted just a couple of days yes. ago. And Walk Away um, is great. So we had a, a question from someone that is uh, volunteering with a group that provides free repair of household items, you know, lamps and lawnmowers and electronics. And uh, most of the people involved are not techies. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question is, how can they help to bridge the narrative? to show the, the people involved that they're also hackers and that they should be interested in supporting hacker spaces, maker spaces in their community. In other words, I think the question is about cross-fertilization between the technology mm -hmm. side and the, the rest. Mm -hmm. So first, huge respect to the person who asked this question, uh, both for their volunteer work and uh, for what they see. Because for me, this is one of the biggest and most important questions for the hacker movement right now. and. I, I feel the most important thing is to make uh, the hacker movement less threatening uh, and to make us, as I described, when you tell a regular person about hacker communities, they think about that F society from Mr. Robot. Somebody is gonna get hurt somewhere in the process. So uh, a lot of uh, organizations uh, came up with repair shops, came up with, uh, different names for hacker spaces and I was suggested to do the same with my work uh, as well but I feel that we can make hacker spaces less threatening. My own concept was to uh, introduce somebody who is very humane, who has very human needs and emotions and describe how they use technology and how they need to modify it. Mm -hmm. So if I manage to finish a glider anytime soon, I welcome you to use all the examples. If not, the wiki and everything for the project is in Creative Commons. But I think there's one more, uh, one more source that I should recommend you. Uh, there was that great talk a few years back. It was called Programming uh, is Forgetting uh, Hacker Questions, which was about hacker ethics and actually how we can bridge the gap uh, between us and uh, regular people, how we can start talking more uh, accessible language by basically uh, checking if our assumptions uh, don't make the, don't make what we say completely uh, opaque. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that recommendation. I think we're just in our last uh, few seconds here, and I, uh, you, you led me right in because we've talked so much about literature, and uh, but we also want to know some of the questioners in the 
room. They want to know, well, are there TV shows, movies, even games, role-playing games that might be informative? Because as you know, not everyone reads a lot. Mm -hmm. So give me a second. Boop, 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 boop. There is one game. If you want role-playing games, Legacy, Life Among the Ruins, it looks post-apocalyptic, but it's not necessarily. Uh, it's a game about rebuilding society, and it's a game where you don't control a single character, but a community, and I find it absolutely awesome and perfect for exploring such topics. As for the TV shows, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're about out of time. So, so uh, the, the discussion continues in Matrix chat and during the rest of Hope. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for the movie. Thank you for the discussion, the presentation, and especially thank you for the optimism. I feel like uh, we don't always tell the, the positive story here, and this is what we brought during this session. So thanks again. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.